We are live from London. <laughs> we are joined by Andrea Piccini uh, right now. It looks like it's just us two in here, but hopefully some people will start trickling in here. There we go. We have some people now. We'll wait a couple minutes to kick off. I already see founder of Amigas in here. See a few hyper founders, chest, perfect test drive, my colleague Hayden. Thank you all for joining and being punctual. We won't hold it against those other ones that are late joining. Where about in London are you based, Bill? We are based in Moorgate. How about Morgate. you? Uh, so I, I mainly work from home and I'm in northwest London. It's not central. I don't know if you know Rice Lake on the Metropolitan Line, quite further uh, on. Yeah, a bit. I've been on the Metropolitan Line, I think, just going to Wembley. That's the only time I've been. Yeah, it's a bit further out. Yeah. Okay, nice. Yeah. I, uh, I live in Hoxton, so I'm luckily able to just cycle in every day. So um, we'll kind of kick off here shortly. Um, Harriet's here as well. Welcome, Harriet. Uh, just want to, like, I guess, set the scene a little bit for everyone. Um, we're joined by Andrea here. I'm going to um, be asking questions throughout the process, but uh, you guys can submit some questions. I'll be moderating them, uh, and then we can, at the end, um, you guys can also ask some questions. We'll leave some time there at the end. Okay. Thank you all for coming. Um, my name is Bill Amos. I'm a startup advisor here at Hyper. We work with founders from idea stage to launch. My role at Hyper is really, uh, like I mentioned, as a startup advisor, I'm working with the founders on all the commercial elements. So that's getting them, uh, what I like to say, investment ready. And part of being investment ready is being able to uh, successfully pitch your startup to potential investors. Uh, so I thought it'd be super valuable to have uh, Andrea on here. Uh, I have to admit it's somewhat selfishly that I asked Andrea to join here today. I myself uh, struggle a bit with presenting. I uh, have a bit of jitter jitters sometimes. You can see I can't even speak right now. So it's exciting to have Andrea here so I can learn from him and all of the founders can also learn from him. And so uh, Andrea Pacini is the head of Idea Stage, head of Ideas on Stage UK. Uh, he is a presentation coach and author of The Confident Presenter. You can go online. Uh, I will drop the link probably into the comments of this uh, event after, so you can actually get a free copy of his book, Confident Presenter, which is what I did this morning. So I'm excited to actually uh, read up on his uh, information after this as well. Thank you, Andrea. Um, I guess it'd be great to just get a little bit of a, a background into you. Um, you know, what inspired you to, uh, you know, work as a presentation coach? Sure. No, thank you, Bill. Thank, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. And yes, the, the reason why I do what I do, the reason why I'm so passionate about pitching, presenting, public speaking, communication in general is because when I was a little kid growing up in Italy, I grew up in a family of very small business owners. My parents have always been running their own very small business together. They still do. And so as a kid, I saw their challenges because raising four kids while trying to run a business is not easy. But I also saw their entrepreneurial mindset, their proactive approach to life. And so that's why I always wanted to be an entrepreneur, to run my own thing. Now, in reality, there remained a dream for a long time because before doing what I do now, I tried many things, started many projects, all of them failed. But it was useful because in that process, what I realized was that there are so many great ideas that fail, not because of the ideas themselves, but just because of the way they are presented. And that's why, to cut it short, eventually I became a presentation coach. That's why my mission today is to stop great ideas from failing, from not being remembered, not being embraced, not being acted upon. Again, not because of the ideas themselves, but just because of the way they are presented. My vision, Bill, is to help hundreds of thousands of founders, entrepreneurs, and business owners inspire their audiences, 
increase the influence and, and why not make a positive impact in the world i believe that we can all make a positive impact in the world and we can do that thanks to the power of our communication yeah it's really uh, amazing background i feel so strongly about that like you see you see ideas fail you know from the investment stand standpoint of you know presenting but also the marketing standpoint so it's really important to always be telling a story within everything you do especially as an early stage founder um I've watched a bit of your, a few of your podcasts. Um, I saw that you like to discuss, uh, you know, three main areas in creating a pitch uh, or presentation. That's message, visuals, and delivery. I was wondering if you could just kind of build on these uh, and perhaps share where you see people make the most mistakes. Sure. You're right. So good, good preparation, Bill. Uh, I do talk about three key areas. These are the three key areas that we need to master if we want to become more effective presenters. Message, visuals, and delivery. Message, this is the content of your presentation. That's the most important thing. I say presentation, it could be your pitch, it could be an investor pitch in many other contexts as well. But this is what you say during a pitch, during a presentation. The delivery side of things is not what you say, it's how you say it. So for example, these are things like eye contact, body language, gestures, posture, voice. So it's not just what you say, which, is, which I believe is the most important thing, but it's also how you say it. And then you also have the visual element. Now, if you, if you think about, let's, let's take an investor pitch as an example. Often that, that pitch is a PowerPoint document. I say PowerPoint, it could be any other presentation tool. It doesn't make any difference. But what I see now, you talked about mistakes. Definitely one key mistake from a visual perspective is that the typical death by PowerPoint. I often see lots of text and bullet points on, on slides. People can't read and listen at the same time. So the visual element is what you show when you say it. And if any of these three key elements is missing, you will find it hard to reach your objective. It's a bit like going to the theater. If you go to a theater, you watch a show. Now, a theater has the screenplay, and that's the message. That's the content of the show. It also has actors, and that covers the delivery side of things. And, and a theater also has the set design. And if any of these three key elements is missing, you will not enjoy your night at the theater. The same is true with your pitches, with your presentations. If any of these three key elements, your message, your visuals, or your delivery is either missing, or if you don't cover them effectively, you will find it hard to reach your objective. So that's for the three key messages. You asked about some, some mistakes. I mentioned one already, which is around the that's visual side of things, PowerPoint. <laughs> now, the most important one though, and it's the number one barrier in communication is the curse of knowledge. Now, I'll give you an example, Bill. And this is something I've learned in a fantastic book, Made to Stick by the Heath Brothers, Made to Stick. And they give this example where in 1990, a psychology student asked two groups of people to play a game, tappers versus listeners. If you were a tapper, you had to tap out rhythms to famous songs on a table. So think about very famous songs like Happy Birthday to You, songs like that. But instead of singing the songs, you just had to tap them out on a table, just the rhythm. Mm -hmm. The listeners, they, they had to try and guess the songs. Before the experiment started, the student asked the tappers to estimate how many songs they thought that the listeners would have guessed and they estimated 50%, 50 percent of the songs. In reality, it was very different because the, the listeners only guessed two and a half percent of the songs. Two and a half versus 50, massive difference. Why? Because if you are a tapper, you have knowledge that the listeners don't have. Mm -hmm. If you're a tapper, you have the songs in your head. So for you, it's obvious. And you find it very hard to understand why the listeners can't guess the songs. But if you're a listener, it's not that obvious because you don't have that knowledge and it's very hard. And if you, and by the way, this is, this is the number one problem in communication. It's called the curse of knowledge. Once we know something, we find it hard to imagine what it means not knowing it. 
Mm -hmm. we, we find it hard to put ourselves in the audience's shoes and to explain a message, our ideas, in a way that that's simple for everyone to understand, even those who don't have the same level of experience or knowledge about a subject. And it's a very common trap, a very common mistake, especially when it comes to presenting, public speaking and pitching. Yeah, I mean, just to kind of build on that, and I'm happy, uh, I knew I was going to learn some some key takeaways here, just the curse of knowledge, knowing that um, that's, what, that's what it's called. That's This is, you know, the main challenge that I have with working with our founders is, and I always say they do it like the biggest mistake that founders make in creating a pitch deck is they have this kind of subconscious bias because it's their baby that the reader or the listeners will already kind of understand what it is you're you're trying to say. So I say, write it. You know, so a 12 year old that would have no knowledge prior can easily understand what it is you do, how you do it, why you'll be a paradigm shift in this industry. And then probably before that, why people will pay for it. So that's the main things I try and get across. But easily the biggest mistake people make is they, you know, you see it in pitch decks, you see it in um, landing pages, you go through it and you still you get to the, the bottom of the landing page or page six of the pitch deck and you have no idea what's going on here. And I think that is the number one thing. And then death by PowerPoint, uh, you know, I, I definitely see that as well. And I think in, in a lot of ways you have to have multiple pitch decks, but that's, you know, a, a story for another time. Um, one thing that I, I think is, would be interesting to get some of your knowledge on is how do you go about uh, preparing for presentations, whether they're going to be in person versus online? For me, Bill, there are three three key differences between in-person and online presentations. The first one is around the, the setup, the technology that you use. Now, if you are pitching, if you are presenting in person, technology doesn't and shouldn't play a major role. The, the worst thing that can happen is that, for example, you go there, you want to show some slides, and then the projector fails, the screen fails, you can't do that. Now, this is like a horror movie for many people, but if you are prepared, you will be able to, you have to be able to go ahead and, and deliver a good presentation anyway. So, so that's, that's the only thing from a technological perspective. Online, now, for example, now this is not, I'm not speaking in public, but we're having this conversation online. Technology is one of the most important things. If, if things fail, then we can't have the conversation. The same is true. When, when pitching, when presenting online. And you want, to be, you want to pay attention to the overall setup as well. So things like having a good camera, a microphone, lighting, background. We, we need to be kind to each other. Most people since 2020 are working from home, which is totally fine. But you want to make sure that you have a setup that allows you to deliver your message effectively. So that's one thing. The other thing is, the, the other difference is the level of interaction that you're planning with the audience. Now, you always want to make sure that your presentation is not one-way communication. If the context allows you to do that, you want to turn a typical presentation into a conversation. It has to feel like a conversation for the audience. Now, in person, research tells us that the audience's attention tends to drop after about 10 minutes. So it's as if every 10 minutes you need to buy the audience's attention back. Now, online, we know that it's harder to keep the audience's attention high. And so that mm -hmm. means that the 10-minute rule becomes the three to five-minute rule. And that means that if you are pitching, and it could be to an investor, for example, now, if you just have three or five minutes, that's it, you don't have to worry about this. But if, it's a, if you're giving a presentation which is a bit longer than that, Online, every three to five minutes, you need to find a way to engage the audience into the conversation. Let them be part of the conversation. It doesn't have to be complicated. It could be as simple as mm -hmm. asking a quick question, which is connected to, to some of your key points. So, so that's another key difference. And then you also have another difference, which is around the delivery side of things. Now, I'll give you just one example, Bill. If you think about eye contact, now, we said earlier that I believe that the most important thing is your message. Without a story that resonates with the audience, it doesn't matter how good you are from a delivery perspective. But still, mm -hmm. your delivery skills, if you, if you approach it well, are going to amplify the quality and the power of your message. One delivery skill, one delivery technique is eye contact. There are others as well. 
without eye, con eye, eye contact, it's hard to, to make a good connection with the audience. The principle is the same. You want to make good eye contact. The way you do it is different. The way you make eye contact in person when you have some people in front of you is different to the way you make good eye contact online. Uh, online, what we want to do is we want to look at the camera. That's what the audience is. Whereas what most people do is they look at themselves, they look at the screen, they look at their slides. Mm -hmm. Every time you do that, you miss out on the opportunity to make a good connection with the audience. So the, the three to summarize the three key differences I see, one is the setup, the technological aspect. The second one was around the need to interact even more with the audience online. Mm -hmm. And the third one is that you've got some delivery techniques like hand gestures. We talked about eye contact, same principle, but the way you apply the principle, the technique is different online. Nice. I need to try and focus on the eye contact here, but let's go ahead and bring the, the audience in. So I'd be curious, um, right in here in the message bar, uh, you know, some of the challenges that you guys or fears you guys have, um, you know, around presenting. It'd be interesting to see everyone. So let's take some uh, points right now from Andrea. Let's get some activity going. Let's get something flowing here. Um, in, the, in the meantime, Bill, as as we wait for that, I want to go back to something you said. You 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 suggest that your founders, those who are part of your of your community, use language that a 12 year old would understand that's great advice so i always say to to, to my clients for example use language that like maximum a 15 year old should be able to understand it that's what great communicators use they use language that a 15 year old would understand and it's not about oversimplifying things it's not about dumbing it down it's about finding and using language that everyone can understand your ideas may be complex they may be technical but the way you explain your ideas the language you use to explain your ideas should never be yeah agreed got you um okay moving forward while we're waiting that seems like everyone's scared to to say what they're scared about so uh we'll we'll move on how uh should founders approach designing visual aids for presenting very much connected to what we said, you want to avoid the typical death by PowerPoint. Every time you show a slide full of screen and you are there presenting, when I say you are there, it could be in person, it could be online, it doesn't make any difference. But if, you, if you've if you got a lot going on on your slide, lots of text, bullet points, I often see slides way too cluttered with so many elements, the audience, the investors in this case, We'll need to choose. Do I listen to Bill or do I listen to Andrea? Do I, do, do I read the text? It's not possible to do both things at the same time. The a brain, pros, uh, this is not my opinion. Again, if you look at how a brain works, a brain processes written text in the same part of the brain that processes spoken text. Mm -hmm. And so that means that reading and listening are two conflicting ideas for your for, for your audience. So you want to keep your slides simple, visual, one idea per slide, not two. If you've got two ideas, two slides, one idea per, per slide, you want to treat them as something that supports, reinforces, and amplifies what you're saying, not as something that replicates what you're saying. You are the presentation, not your slides. Now, you said at the very beginning that there is a difference between slides that we use when we are presenting live and a different version of your deck that you use in a different context. And I agree with you, Bill, 100%. Slides and documents are two different things and they should be separated. It's a bit like, again, like you will never use your toothbrush to comb your hair. And that's a very bad example if you look at me, but you will never do that. You will never use your toothbrush to comb your hair. <laughs> you <having> <laughs> Just because it has bristles like your hairbrush. A toothbrush and a hairbrush are two different things and you use them for two different, two different activities. Slides and documents or handouts are also two different things and you should use them for, in two different contexts. So mm -hmm. when you are there presenting, either online or in person, but you you are the presentation, you keep your slides simple and visual. And then if the audience, if the investors, and, and often that's the case, if, if they need to have more details, 
then the version of your deck that you send either before or after the meeting after the presentation depending on what works best that version has to be different that version can include as many details as you want and this differentiation is key yeah exactly i think it's important to have two different decks one you know can tell the same story i think interesting your point to no slide should have uh you know two messages on there i think that's something that i need to to think about more critically um in, tr in trying to work with the founders and the decks because sometimes we are cramming some things in there but you know that's maybe more for the deck that we're sending before or after and then we just really simplify and cut i usually just try and cut out all the the main copy uh whenever doing the presentation deck on, on uh, that point bill on that point so if you have two very important messages and they are they are both very much connected to each other and you think that it makes sense to have them both on on the same slide so again either two slides or if you just want to have one slide now depending on how you're planning to deliver those messages if you're talking about these two messages at the same time then you can have them on the same slide if if you can if you want to have them on the same slide but for example say that you spend some time talking about one message and then you sp and then after one minute or two you start talking about something else then it's very simple you just use a very simple animation first you click and you have just one thing appearing which is your first key point and then you click again and then you have the second thing appearing because if you don't then you will spend maybe two minutes talking about something who tells you that the audience is not looking at the other thing so you also need to guide the the viewer's eye from a presentation mm -hmm. design perspective yeah really really well said um this is something that I think I struggle with a bit. Uh, I was coming from, I you know, started my business career late. I came from from sports and I had a bit of, um, I guess, imposter syndrome at times. And so whenever I, and it really manifested whenever I would be presenting. I, I previously uh, co-founded a startup and I was the one, I, we actually had co-CEOs and we decided let's lean into our strengths. He did the pitching and I did the Q&A, but that was mostly just because I didn't want to do anything to do with pitching. Uh, so what techniques can founders use to project confidence and credibility when pitching, uh, to high stakes audience, such as audiences, such as investors or potential partners? Okay. So Bill, we can talk about lots of techniques, of course, but before we get there, it's very important to understand where confidence in presenting comes from. And that's that's exactly why I wrote that book. My book is called Confident Presenter because I think that there, there's a bit of a misunderstanding. There's, there's some confusion when it comes to what people think about where confidence comes from. Now, many people think that confidence in presenting comes from natural talent or self-belief wishful thinking or or when we think about presenting again many people immediately start thinking about the delivery side of things now confidence comes from three things number one familiarity and preparation the more familiar you are doing certain things the more and the more prepared you are the more confident you would be. Now, for example, some time ago, I watched an interview of Kobe Bryant, one of the best NBA players of all time. And one of the questions was, Kobe, how is it possible that every time I see you playing, you always look so confident? And he said, the only reason why you think I'm confident is because when you see me doing certain things, I've done those things a thousand times before. Confidence comes from preparation, from familiarity. That's one thing. The other thing is that confidence comes from following a certain process. There's a structured way of thinking about presenting, which has, which goes way beyond opening up, opening up PowerPoint and putting together some slides. It also goes beyond just the delivery side of things. So here is, here is how I look at it. Number one, the foundation of the presentation process is understanding the audience, asking yourself some questions about the audience and their needs and the context so that you can create something which is relevant to them. And by the way, that's another key mistake I see. We can, we can talk about it later if there's an interest. 
After that, you also need to know how to identify your key messages. You also need to know how to create a clear and engaging storyline. From the very beginning, you want to grab the audience's attention to the very end. And depending on what presentation we are talking about, is it an investor pitch? Is it a pitch to a potential client? Then there are different storylines that work better in different situations. Then you have the illustration side of things like PowerPoint slides, and then you have the connection element with the audience the importance of rehearsing, delivery techniques. So that's what I mean when I say there's a structured way of thinking about presenting and not following that process is often what creates discomfort when we are in front of an audience. And then finally, again, in my experience, Bill, 80%, 80, 80 percent of your confidence comes from your ability to develop a compelling message. It's not about your delivery. Again, without a message, without a story, that that's simple for the audience to understand that's clear for them to follow that's relevant to them also a story which is engaging it doesn't matter how good you are from a delivery perspective and that's where confidence comes from and all the techniques we can talk about are based on these foundational pieces that's yeah really interesting uh preparation I, i've definitely heard that kobe bryant quote and i try to uh implement that and i but still i'm not waking up at 3 a.m and <laughs> getting up a thousand shots like he was doing um i can kind of tell one little quick anecdote whenever i was because everyone's a founder here and, and i'm sure you uh, hopefully you don't feel the same type of nerves that i did uh whenever i was pitching but Whenever I pitched my uh, startup for investment to Antler Accelerator, I woke up and it was virtual. Uh, we had our slides, probably too much copy in them, uh, learned those lessons. Uh, but I think I listened to Three Little Birds by Ma Bob Marley. The pitch was at 11 a.m. And I think I listened to it just on repeat. Every little thing is going to be all right <laughs> for three hours straight. <laughs> so uh, that's another that's what I tell myself no matter what happens here, you know, the, the sun's going to come up and everything's going to be fine. So you'll find investment in another way if you have to. Everything's going to work out. Um, a couple of things, Bill, if you don't mind. Yeah. One is I'm going to try and include that, that thing into my own ritual. I've got like a warm-up ritual before any presentation. So I'm going to include Bob Marley as well. <laughs> also... Another thing we got investment, to... so it worked. Oh, it worked perfect. So definitely, <laughs> I'm going to include it. Now, another thing is, if you feel nervous before presenting, uh, I'm not just talking to you, Bill. I'm talking to everyone here. We, we all do. It's it's normal. It's natural. Again, Mark Twain said that there are only two types of speakers: those who get nervous and those who are liars. So we always feel nervous. I, I'm a, I don't want to take me as an example, but I'm a presentation coach. I present all the time. Me with my colleagues, we help others do the same, but I always feel nervous before speaking in public. Now, of course, there are things that are also practical things that can be done and we should do. I wouldn't say to overcome the nerves because I think that's impossible. We will always feel something, but yes, there are things that we can do to address them to channel them in a more positive way i love uh mark twain quotes and quite a lot of our founders that are in here will have heard me reference uh, my favorite one that is um i didn't have time to write a short letter so i wrote a long one instead and i said it yesterday in a meeting with harriet so and i told her that i was going to reference it today so there's my shout out um how now, so I guess a question over to you. How can you quickly explain your business idea without losing key details? Okay, so that's connected to what Mark Twain said. I didn't have time to write a, long, a short letter, <laughs> yeah. so I created, I wrote a long one. Now, let's take the, Bill, shall we take the the example of an investor pitch? Is that, mm -hmm. I guess? Yeah, yeah. sounds great, yeah. So let's say that you have five minutes, no more, to pitch your idea to an investor. And, and often that's the case. They give you five minutes. You could have 10, maximum 20 minutes. They, they, they don't give you, especially the first meeting, you will never have an hour. Now, if you just have five minutes, remember these, remember these words. It's, you want to create a pitch, which is like a post-it, like a post-it note, like a sticky note, post-it. And post-it stands for six things, the six key ingredients of a successful investor pitch. The P stands for problem. So you start with the problem that you are solving, the problem you're trying to solve. The O stands for opportunity. 
because so that's the market opportunity not every problem is worth solving from an investor perspective so for example i don't like artichokes that's my problem is it is this a problem worth solving is there a market opportunity i don't know maybe there is i'm not saying there isn't but i don't know but it's not enough to just talk about the problem you also want to make it clear to the investors What's the market opportunity behind that problem? So you've got problem opportunity. The S stands for solution. So you explain how you are solving that problem. Then you have T. T stands for time frame. So these are the key milestones. What have you achieved so far? What are you, what are you planning to achieve in the near future? So we've got problem, opportunity, solution, time frame. I stands for investment. So this is this is the ask. What? How much money do you need? one another we were talking about mistakes before a common mistake i see here is by the way believe it or not bill i've seen investor pitches where the ask like how much money they they were looking for was not included so presenting is not a, a mind reading exercise if we if mm -hmm. you want the audience to do something and this is it's not just for investor pitches in general if you want the audience to do something then tell them what you want them to do. You want to be very clear about that. Another mistake I see is that even if the, the investment, the, the ask is included, but then we, we don't explain how, how that amount of money is going to help you achieve your key milestones that you talked about mm -hmm. in, in the pitch. So often i see the, the the best i see is okay we we are looking for this amount of money we're looking for two hundred and fifty thousand pounds and then we are going to use 30 percent of that for marketing 70 60 um, percent for r d and 10 percent for operations now that's mm -hmm. okay that's already much better than not including the, the investment but you also want to find a way to explain to the investors how the money you are requesting is is linked to the key milestones that you're planning to to achieve so you've got investment and then the final t stands for team we all know that investors don't just invest on ideas they invest in people in the team behind it so if you and we we do it with the clients it is possible you can go through this framework six things in five minutes problem opportunity solution time frame investment and team then if you have time or maybe it could be in the q a after the the pitch then you can go into a little bit more detail but these are the essential elements yeah i, I agree and i think the challenging part of that is uh, you know how do you weave a story into something like that um one of the ways that i do it uh or and every also i will say like i think every startup is different so you should tell your own story in your own way um and then also pitch decks and presentations are are still subjective so if you try to please everyone you're going to end up pleasing no one because you're going to have a, a 35 page slide deck um so one of the ways that we you know suggest in, in one of our frameworks is identifying a ideal customer profile and, and building the story around that person within a pitch deck but what are some other ways that uh, storytelling can play in a uh, successful startup pitching? So your, your suggestion is one possibility and it works really well. Another one could be as simple as explaining one of these key elements that we've just described, the positive framework. One of them, you can, you can illustrate it with a story or with an example. The obvious, the obvious example is the problem. So you talk about the problem, is there an example that you can give? Storytelling mm -hmm. is not about telling a once upon a time type of story. It could be as simple as an example. Is there an example that illustrates the problem that you are solving? So it doesn't have to be a story that goes through the entire storyline of your pitch. It could be mm -hmm. a little example that illustrates the problem. It could be an example that illustrates the, the solution. Now, storytelling is super powerful because that's how our brain works we remember stories much more than just facts and figures facts and figures are important but it's not enough now for example if i let's do this bill i can tell you i'll give you an example i could i could tell you that the 
most important thing in any presentation, the very first thing you want to do is you want to start with the audience. You want to take some time to ask yourself some questions about the audience because that's the only way for you to, to create a pitch, a presentation that works for them. So that's my message. I could leave it there. I could leave it there. And if that's, if that's all I do, then most likely after this conversation, you'll forget it. Everyone will forget it. But I, or I could say, I could tell you that message and then I could say, Bill, I'll give you an example. Some time ago, we worked with a client. Her name is Marie from Paris. Marie is an executive. She's an expert in leadership. And she was invited by an association in Finland to give a talk about leadership. And she was super excited. It was one of the first international speaking opportunities. And so she prepared really well. Remember, Bill, the, the three key things that we talked about at the very beginning, message, visuals, and delivery. So she knew her message. She, she told us that she had prepared 50, 5 zero, 50 beautiful slides. And also she practiced. And so she was ready to go. She flew to Finland the day before the conference, then arrived there on the day half an hour before the audience because she wanted to make sure that she had time to set things up. And when she was about to connect her laptop to the screen, she realized that there was no screen. So a little bit of panic, she went and asked the organizers, assuming that they would say, oh, sorry, Marie, now we're going to fix this for you. We're going to find a screen for you. But what they did instead was they started laughing. They started laughing. And so she says, why are you laughing? And they say, look, Marie, you want to show 50 slides, but actually you've been invited to give a talk to the Association in Finland of Blind People. Blind people. Wow. Now, I know it's an extreme example. It sounds like a bad joke, but it happened for real. Now, without going into more details, but if I, if I give you an example like this, it's going to be much more likely that in a few hours, maybe in a few days, maybe even a few weeks, you will still remember that story. You will still remember what happened to Marie. And then hopefully you will also connect it to the key point. And the key point is that you, if you want to create something which is relevant to the audience, you need to start with them. So for everyone, every time you have an important message you want to get across and you want the audience, you want the investors to remember the point, ask yourself, is there a story that you can tell to illustrate that point? It could be a personal story, something that happened to you. It could be a story about other people, something that happened to someone else. It could be a story of success. Say, for example, that there is you have an existing client and their company is already successfully using your product or service. That's a story. So if mm -hmm. we think about it, there's always a story to tell. The problem with most business presentations is that they are 99% facts. And then if we are lucky, if we are lucky, 1% is story. It's a bit unbalanced. So for everyone, tell more stories, give more examples. And this is the most powerful thing you can do to make your message more original and enjoyable. Yeah, just the meta, it's quite meta telling the story about telling the story there. So that was amazing. And I think It'll be interesting to see, you know, the takeaways from here for people. Maybe that's the the main takeaway is, you know, that story, or maybe it's the story of me, you know, listening to to Bob Marley. But it's like, yeah, it's weaving in these anecdotes. I think is is some of the most uh, powerful ways that you can present. Let me give you, um, Bill. Let me give you to reinforce what you've just said. Mm -hmm. There's there was a study carried out by Professor Atkinson. He's the author of "Lend Me Your Ears." It's a public speaking book. "Lend Me Your Ears." And in that study, there were two cameras during a conference, two cameras. One camera was looking at the speaker, another camera was looking at the audience. And every time the speaker used the phrase, for example, or I'll give you an example, or let me give you an example, then you could see the audience, maybe they were checking their phones, and then with the faces, they would go up paying attention to what the speaker had to say. So again, it's just a matter of thinking about a quick anecdote, because storytelling is not about telling a story for the sake of telling a story. You want to tell a story that makes a point. And again, the audience will make that connection. And you start the story with something like, for example, let me give an example. I'll give an example and the audience will pay attention to what's coming next.
That's fascinating. That's probably going to be the thing that I remember the most from this session. So I'm, I'm really excited for that. Um, next question I have for you. Why is authenticity important when presenting? I'm laughing because authenticity is an interesting one. Yeah, of course. And, and I'll give you an answer that may be... It may not be what you're looking for. I don't know. Let's see, Bill, but, because I have a, my own take on authenticity. Now, of course, yes, you want to be authentic. Of course, you want to be yourself. You don't. You don't. You don't have. You don't want to be Steve Jobs or or like Simon Sinek or anyone. No, you you want to be yourself. But at the same time, you want to be the best. You want to become the best version of yourself as a as a presenter, as a communicator, and Way too often, if I think about when, when we work with a client, I see that authenticity is used as an excuse for not changing, for not, for not improving. For example, when, when we encourage our clients to include storytelling in their content or to do certain things from a delivery perspective, there's a bit of resistance. And they say, oh, this is not me. It doesn't feel natural. I'm not comfortable with that. And I want I want this to be an authentic pr presentation, and, and that to me that tells me that they are they are using authenticity as an excuse for not changing. Now, for example, if if you want to learn how to play the piano, and the teacher tells you that you need to have a certain posture and you need to use your fingers in a certain way, and you need to do a few like particular techniques. Uh, would you tell the teacher, no, I'm not going to do that because it's, it's not me. It doesn't feel authentic. No, you would just, if you want to learn, you would just shut up and do what the teacher says. Or if you secretly think that your friend's new baby is ugly, would you tell them because you, because because you're authentic and so part of the authenticity is, is also that you are an honest person, you say what you think, would you do that? No, you would just say that the baby is beautiful. I'm saying this because there are many other, there are many areas in our lives where we choose not to be authentic because because it works better. And so it's not really about being authentic. What we need to look for, we need to look for effectiveness. You want to be effective. Now again, don't get me wrong, Bill. You, yes, you want to be authentic. Yes, you want to be yourself, but at the same time, you want to become the best authentic version of yourself. <laughs> Lindsay's written in saying she would. I'm assuming that means say that the the baby is ugly. The baby is ugly. You would. <laughs> <Yeah>. Amazing, Lindsay. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I, I guess to give uh, my own little anecdote here. So, for example, um, I in a past life, whenever I was still playing basketball, I used to like try and come up with a hobby every single year. And one of those years I was trying to d learn stand up comedy. So I was doing stand up. Uh, I always, you know, try to be myself, but I was almost trying to enter into another like a, a character of myself at that time. Like, oh, I am a stand up comedian. This is what I do. I'm going on stage and this is, you know, there's no reason to be nervous because this is what I do every day. So I was trying to stay, you know, authentic to myself but also, you know, psyching myself up into the fact that they're, you know, this is who I am. So, and I've, I've referenced that sometimes with our founders, it's like, if you need to, you know, enter into a character, uh, you can do that in presenting if it makes you feel more comfortable. However, you know, coming back to that level of it, you need to still be you. Yeah, and stand-up comedy, I love stand-up comedy. I think, Bill, that the stand-up comedians are the best public speakers in the world. Yeah, agreed. Uh, that's what, probably why I gave it up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so one thing, um, hold on, I have three more questions left. Let's see how much time we have. It'd be great if, you know, if people do want to submit any questions, I'll kind of moderate those. Um, what are the most effective ways? Okay, so my next question would be, how can rehearsal strategies help founders refine pitches? And what are the most effective ways to practice? Rehearsing is one of the most important things you can do if you want to deliver your pitch in an effective way. If you think about most of the challenges you have from a delivery perspective, so if you think about the context of you being in front of a group of people, again, it could be in person, it could be online, 
most of the challenges from that perspective can be either solved or at least addressed, improved just by rehearsing, including nerves and anxiety associated with that, with that particular experience. I'll give you I'll give you an example here. I interviewed on the Ideas on Stage podcast Mark Leroust. Mark gave a um, TEDx talk in Cardiff a few years ago. And by the way, the, the topic of that talk is going to be very interesting for our audience today because he talks about the title is something along the lines of what they don't tell you about entrepreneurship. So it's 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 about entrepreneurship. And it's a great talk. And it has been viewed more than a million times, the most viewed TEDx talk in Cardiff ever. And he told me that in preparation for that talk, he rehearsed it 21 times in 21 different locations in London to 21 different audiences. So not only did he rehearse, he also rehearsed in the real world, in front of actual audiences. That's what great presenters do. If possible, you want to rehearse in conditions, either physical conditions or at least mental conditions, which are as close as possible to the real conditions. Now, a key, again, going back to one of your first questions, mistakes. A very common mistake I see is that either people don't rehearse or what they do is they think they are rehearsing. Instead, what they're doing is they are practicing. There's a, diff there's a key difference between practicing and rehearsing. Practicing means, for example, say that you have your slides, you open up your PowerPoint, and then you look at slide one, and you say, okay, now here I will be talking about this. And then you change, and here I'll talk about that. Maybe you start repeating a little bit, but then as you do, you realize that something is not quite right. You need to change something. You go back and change it. That's a practice session, which is important, but it's not enough. Rehearsing means repeating your presentation out loud from the very beginning to the very end without stopping as if there is a real there is a real audience in front of you and you want to do that several times there is no magic number what works for me doesn't necessarily work for you but you want to do that a few times that's the only way for you to internalize your content you don't have to memorize it but you need to internalize it you, you need to own your content and this is key for you to be able to deliver a great pitch or presentation that's really interesting difference between rehearsing and pitching i'll definitely take that rehearsing well. and practicing yeah or rehearsing and practicing sorry rehearsing and practicing um how do you go about and we're coming to the end here so i'll, I'll kind of end on a, a question in regards to ending how do you close a pitch to leave a lasting impression i'll give you a practical framework that, that you that everyone can can follow here we use it all the time with our clients we call it what so what what next? And it's a framework that allows you to simplify your message, to get to the core of what it is that you want to communicate, and it works really well as a conclusion. And it comes from a, a realization we had many years ago. We were working with a client. His name is Luc Breton, again, again from Paris. Luc used to be one of the executive vice presidents at Orange, big company, and he was a great presenter. And he told us, I only I only remember one thing from a pitch. Just tell me what I need to know. No more. One thing for everyone. Have you ever thought about this? What's your one thing? If you were to summarize the core idea behind your next pitch in one message, not two, one message, what would you say? And how would you say in maximum 70 words? That's it, 30 seconds. I can promise you. If you can communicate it in that time, then you can communicate it in longer. If not, your message isn't simple enough. And the way to do that is to follow this framework. What, so what, what next? Here is how it works. First of all, the what. Okay, what's the key message? What's the one thing you want your audience, you want your investors to understand, remember, take away from your pitch? And that's important, but it's not enough. You also need to explain the so what. Why should they care? Why is your message important and relevant to them, to your audience, not to you? And again, depending on the context, the so what will be different. If you're pitching to investors, there will be a certain kind of so what. Why does this matter to them, to the investors? 
if you're pitching to potential clients, most likely the so what will be different. Again, it, it, has, it always depends on the audience. And then what next? Okay, now that they care, now that they understand why this is important to them, what do you want them to do after your presentation? Or at the very least, what do you want them to believe, to feel as a result of your presentation? If you follow this framework, three key benefits. Number one, it pushes you to simplify your message, to get to the core of the one thing you want them to remember. Number two, when you answer the so what question, you are making it about them. And this is the key to great presenting. The key to great presenting is to always make it about them. I'll give you another quick example here, Bill, and then I'll close. If, so what the, the mistake, whether we are aware of you or not, the mistake most people make is what we do is we often talk at our audiences about us, about mm -hmm. our startup, about our business, our product, our service, our ideas. That's what we do. What you want to do instead is you want to talk to your audience about them, even if you're talking about you. I'll give you a very generic, simple example, but hopefully it makes a point. If I say, Bill, at Ideas on Stage, we have 158 offices all over the world. I'm talking at you about me. If I say at Ideas on Stage, we have 158 offices so that you can get access to a customer support team wherever you are. Now I'm talking to you about you, even if I'm talking mm -hmm. about me. That's the key to represent, presenting. Always make it about them. And then the, the final benefit, connect to your question. Once you have this paragraph, roughly 70 words, it works really well as a conclusion for your pitch. Say, for example, that you gave your pitch and then you say something like, okay, if there's one thing I would really like you to take away from this presentation or from this meeting, it's this. And then you go, what, so what, what next? Or what I want you to remember is this. If you forget everything, but remember one thing, here is what I would like you to remember. If you use any of these phrases or something similar, again, whatever whatever you say next, they will pay attention and that works really well as a conclusion. Thank you. Well, on that note, I hope everyone uh, really got some, some value from today's session. I know that I did, maybe I shouldn't be talking about myself, but I really hope everyone else did here. Um, Andre, if you want to say anything, uh, you know, if you want to reference any of your contact details or anything so people can get in touch, uh, feel free to do it. Um, I'll also be, you know, plugging your, I'll put your LinkedIn information in the, in the, um, in the comments and into the emails and stuff that we're sending as follow-ups. Oh, thank you. Appreciate it, Bill. LinkedIn is definitely the, the, the only social media platform I, I actively use. So for people, feel free to, to connect. Our website is ideasonstage.com. You mentioned my book. I would be very happy to, to send a free copy to everyone. If you are in the UK, you can get the actual physical copy for free. Shipping costs are on us. You don't have to worry about it. If you're not in the UK, you can still get access to the PDF version. We also have, if you want to make the most of the book, we have a free tool online, the Confident Presenter Scorecard, which is a way for you to very quickly assess your current presentation skills against some key principles. You will get a score from zero to 100 percent, and the tool will also explain what the score means for you, and it will give you rooms for suggestions for improvement. Uh, and also, I also often run free presentation skills web classes so again bill uh, maybe you already have some links if not happy to share them with you and then if you want yes, to share please. them if, if if it's helpful for that would people. be great yeah share those over yeah. awesome thank you andrea um for the hyper founders that are in tonight or in here today uh we have a pitch practice this evening uh i don't see the the founders that are pitching this evening uh in here so we can use it for some critiquing of their pitch though. Um, thank you so much, Andrea. Uh, let's definitely stay in touch. Thank you so much. Bye thank everyone. You. Cheers.